When learning about something as complex as the brain, you may be surprised to know that it started as a simple hollow cylinder. Let me explain. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here, and today we're talking about brain development through embryology all the way to adulthood, and we're going to look at the anatomical structures of it as it goes through development, as well as talk about the ventricles or the fluid-filled sacs inside of the brain, as well as some functions of the main parts of the brain. So this should be your one-stop shop for everything brain. So let's get rolling. Now when you are only about, golly, six weeks old, so six weeks in utero, you have formed what's called a neural tube. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a hollow tube surrounded by tissue that are going to become neurons. And we know that neurons are what make up your brain and spinal cord, right? That's your central nervous system. So I want you to think of the outside of this tube and the outside of all of these structures here that are in these different colors are just going to contain a bunch of neurons as well as glial cells, the supporter cells. Now inside of it, however, I said it's a hollow tube that will eventually be filled with a fluid called CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. This is going to help lubricate and kind of give uh, the brain a little bit of buoyancy and the spinal cord a little, little bit of buoyancy so that there's less friction and force on the brain and spinal cord itself. And this CSF is going to fill up the ventricles later on. So let's start first with your early embryo. So in your early embryo, what we see is three distinct structures that have now formed on this neural tube, right? So we're kind of differentiating some tissue. The first part will be right here, the second kind of in the middle, and then the third towards the back. And all in red will be the spinal cord. I'm not going to touch on the spinal cord because this is about brain, but just know it's going to be in red at the end of all of these. So the first part, as you can see, this is the front part or the anterior part of this developing embryo. So therefore, we call this the pros encephalon. Okay, you guys should be prepared. There will be a lot of prefixes and suffixes in this video. So first off, pro always refers to forward. So it's forward facing, like the protagonist is somebody moving the plot forward. And then encephalon is very simple. It just means brain. So anytime you hear encephalon, just know it means brain. Okay. Now you may hear this instead called the forebrain. It's the same exact thing. For just means in front as well. Second part will be called the midbrain. Midbrain is adequately named because it's in the middle of these two other brain structures, right? And it's also sometimes called the mesencephalon. Mesencephalon. Anytime you see mes, it means middle. So we can remember mes is in the middle. And then lastly, we also have the rhombencephalon. Rhombencephalon also called the hindbrain. Now two things here with the hindbrain, you know that your hindquarters is in the back, right? So this is more posterior, but then rhomb, what's that rhomb? Well, a rhombus is kind of like a diamond shaped structure. So they looked at this structure and it kind of looked more like a diamond shape. You don't really see that, but there is kind of a diamond shape to this. So they called it kind of the rhombencephalon or the diamond shaped brain. Very interesting. Now, as we go on into later development, so this is going to be a late embryo, and this can be somewhere around maybe 10 to 12 weeks, we're going to have five differentiated structures that we're going to point out. So we see how the prosencephalon has differentiated into two different tissues. The first one will be called the, I'll draw it in pink, the telencephalon, telencephalon. Now, telos or tele means far off, okay? Very far off. Now, what's interesting about that one is it is very far away from the other structures, but I want you to remember it's far and away the most complex. Far and away the most complex. So that's how I remember it, far away. Because the cerebral, we'll talk about later, has a lot of high-level complex functions. And then we move posteriorly. We now have the diencephalon. Diencephalon. Okay. A couple things here. So you would think, because it says di, D-I, that stands for two. 
Now you can use that as a memory technique because it does come second. However, die actually comes from the prefix dia, which means through. So something moving through something, like the diaphysis of a bone runs through the length of the bone. Now, why did they call it that? Well, they figured out later on that in order to get information to the outer parts of the brain, the cerebrum, and then down through the rest of the tract, it has to all funnel through the diencephalon, specifically the thalamus. So think of this as kind of like the highway from the higher regions of the brain to the lower regions, and that's why they call it the diencephalon, the through brain. Very cool. Now, in the diencephalon, interesting point, we have these two buds here that you can see look like something you may have seen before with your eyes, right? These are called the optic vesicles, and they will give rise to the optic nerve and the eyes, okay? With some other structures associated with it. So you can always see those two spots, optic vesicles, and in fact, this is the only cranial nerve, the optic nerve, that originates from the diencephalon. The rest of them will actually originate from the midbrain, pons, and medulla. That's a fun fact for you. Now, moving forward, we have the easiest one to remember, the midbrain, because the midbrain will stay the same, and we can call it either the midbrain or the mesencephalon. So we'll keep that the same here. Now, here's where the memory techniques kind of fail us. So we know that mes means middle. However, as we move posteriorly, the next one will be called the metencephalon. Metencephalon. Now, with the metencephalon, this just simply means after, okay? After encephalon. So it's the after brain. So we're going after the middle. Not sure that's very helpful. And last but not least, we have the myelencephalon. Myelencephalon on the end. Myelencephalon. And this myel technically means marrow or as pertaining to the spinal cord, which is kind of helpful because it's going to be the one that's butted up right against the spinal cord. Now, that being said, a couple memory techniques and then a couple differentiating helpful uh, properties. As you see the three M's in a row, you notice they go in alphabetical order from M-E-S, M-E-T, and then M-Y. So these are in alphabetical order, that's how you can remember it. And furthermore, you see that the prosencephalon turned into the telencephalon, the diencephalon. The midbrain stayed the same, stayed the mesencephalon, but then at the very end, the rhomencephalon differentiates into both these two. So you see how like one structure turns into two on the top and bottom, and then the middle just stays right in the middle. So you can kind of remember that mirroring parallelism in a way. Really, let's move forward. So now we get the late embryo, but now we're gonna skip all the way into adulthood. So we are now, in an adult brain, we're fully formed, and clearly there's a lot of things that happen from here to here that I don't know about, so we're instead just going to stick with the anatomy of the adult brain. So at the adult brain, what do we have here? Well, the telencephalon, the far and away complex part, is now turned into the cerebrum. Cerebrum, that's the top portion of the brain. I always remember that is what makes you, you. And we're going to go through some more functions of these later on, but we're just going to point out the structures for right now. So that came from the telencephalon. The diencephalon is really easy because diencephalon stays the same. It's the same exact word, diencephalon. But I want you to know that the two major structures, along with some others, will be the hypothalamus in here, hypothalamus, which means below the second structure, thalamus. And we'll also have structures like the pituitary gland and the pineal gland. There's also the epithalamus and the subthalamus. I don't talk about those all that much. Those are the main structures in the diencephalon. Wonderful. Now, the, the way I remember it, the two main structures here, hypothalamus, thalamus, well, we're in the diencephalon too. There's two main structures. Very cool. Now, moving forward, this has been the easiest one, right? We started with this guy being called the midbrain. We went to mesencephalon, which literally translates to midbrain. And guess what? It is still called the midbrain as it's developed. I feel like sometimes anatomists just get lazy. So this is called the midbrain. And I'm going to cluster the midbrain in with some other things in terms of function, so we'll get there later on. 
Now, here's where you see two structures arising from one structure, okay? So the metencephalon will differentiate into two different structures. One will be posterior, and this is the cerebellum. And one will be anterior, and this is called the pons. Very interesting. So here we've got one turning into two. And then lastly, we've got the medulla coming from the myelencephalon. So here's the medulla. And again, that came from the myelencephalon. And finally, I didn't mention this the whole time, but the spinal cord remains relatively the same the whole entire time. Now, very cool. Now, before we get into the functions of these, I want to real quickly discuss some ventricles. So once again, ventricles are going to be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So ventricles, they're just these like pouches of cerebrospinal fluid, pouches or containers of CSF. Again, lubricating, nourishing the brain a little bit, giving it some buoyancy. Now, as you can see, I drew these ventricles in different colors. So the first one we see is actually the lateral ventricles. There's two of them. So right, lateral ventricles, and there's two. And this is where actually the uh, something called the choroid plexus will be. And the choroid plexus will be lining here, and it will actually secrete that cerebrospinal fluid into the lateral ventricles before traveling through the remaining ventricles. So knowing we have two lateral ventricles, we name the next one the third ventricle. So third ventricle will be in this orange. What does that mean about who brought it into existence? Well, it came from the diencephalon, right? Originally from the forebrain, right? So this is called the third ventricle. Okay, and it does surround the diencephalon. You can kind of see that it's in the same region here. Now, question for you, why is this called the third ventricle? Because it's coming third in terms of where the cerebrospinal fluid is made. So I've got a little diagram here of the ventricles. This is the way it's facing, right? So it's very similar, how you see here. Now, you see two lateral ventricles, right? One, oh, I'm too close, one, two. And then you get the third ventricle kind of deeper in right here. Okay, so one, two, three, that's why it's called the third ventricle. Now moving forward, we're going to pass that fluid first through the interventricular foramen, haven't labeled that here, and then into something called the cerebral aqueduct. As you notice, what did the cerebral aqueduct come from? Well, the cerebral aqueduct came from the mesencephalon, right? So we can say from the mesencephalon. Okay, now this is, again, an aqueduct is just kind of a, a tract of water flowing through it. It's very, very thin, and it's going to travel down to the, as you could probably guess, the fourth ventricle down here. It's coming forth. Fourth ventricle, okay? And that's going to be kind of nearby the pons and the cerebellum, obviously, and that's what it arises from is the metencephalon. So the metencephalon turns into the fourth ventricle. And then finally, we have from the myelencephalon, we have the central canal that's actually going to run all the way down through the spinal cord. So it begins in the medulla, as we kind of mentioned, and it travels all the way down through the spinal cord, lubricating, nourishing the spinal cord. So that's the arising of the uh, main ventricles, as well as some fluid-filled chambers like the cerebral aqueduct in the central canal. So before you go, let's get through some functions. Obviously, anatomy is super cool, embryology is super cool, but what do these actually do? What's the point of all these uh, structures? Well, let's just go through them one by one. The cerebrum, I told you earlier that it is far and away, right there, far and away, the most complex. I like to think of the cerebrum as the part of the brain that makes you, you, okay? So in the cerebrum, we've got functions like personality, like movement, so all of your voluntary movement originates here. All of your perception of different stimuli will occur here. Deep emotions and responses to things. Um, yeah, just a variety of things. Memories are also stored here. And I'm just going to start with that for the cerebrum. Now, as we move deeper, I want you to focus on something. As we move deeper, I want you to think of how well protected these structures are. They are like deep within the skull, deep within the, the vertebrae. So they are very well protected. So I want you to think, do you think the more vital functions of the body are out here, like on the periphery of your uh, 
uh, in, yeah, what is it, your cranial cavity, or do you think it's going to be deeper? Well, if you guess deeper for the vital functions, you would be absolutely right. So notice the cerebrum is makes, what makes you you, but it's not what keeps you alive. It's not what keeps you alive. These are the things that are going to keep you, keep you alive. So I'm going to group, whoops, the midbrain and the pons and the medulla all kind of together. So midbrain, pons, and medulla, they do have different functions, but they are all kind of along the same line. So midbrain, pons, and medulla. I know I skipped the dying up one. I'm coming back to it. All of these are going to deal with major reflexes, Things like breathing, things like heart rate, and potentially regulating blood pressure and wakefulness all are housed in this wakefulness. There we go. All are housed in these three structures. And that's why we actually call these three the brain stem. And I just want you to remember vital functions at the brain stem. And it will also be the site of many cranial nerves. A lot of cranial nerves come off of the brain stem. And again, we'll learn that the cranial nerves do a variety of vital functions for your body. Very cool. Now hopping back up, sorry that I skipped the diencephalon. The diencephalon, I'm gonna write here, does a couple very, very important things, diencephalon. First off, the hypothalamus itself is the overarching regulator of homeostasis. So I'm just gonna write homeostasis. And it also gives uh, feedback into a tiny gland underneath the hypothalamus called the pituitary gland. This pituitary gland is called the master regulator gland for the endocrine system. So I'm going to say homeostasis and endocrine functions. It's going to control those. And that's, again, the hypothalamus. So I always remember homeostasis starts with an H. Hypothalamus also starts with an H. And then for the thalamus in the diencephalon, this is going to be your major relay center for sensory information. So basically what happens is as information comes up the spinal cord, it has to again go through the diencephalon, that's what dia means, right? And it gets to the thalamus, and from there, the thalamus determines where do we send that sensory information? Up here, up here, up here, up here. Where does it go? Okay, so that's the thalamus. Think of the thalamus kind of as like the Amazon warehouse where all the shipments come and then they determine where it goes. Very similar to the thalamus. Now there's been some studies how the thalamus deals a little more with um, motivational stuff too. So there's some research coming out, but we just remember it as a relay center for now. And then with the pineal gland, I just want you to write, you can write it down here or up here, wakeful cycles or sleep-wake cycles. Your sleep-wake cycles are regulated by a hormone called melatonin, produced by the pineal gland, melatonin. And melatonin regulates the sleep-wake cycle, so it has a very big role in basically telling you when to sleep and when to stay awake. All right, last bit, we've got the cerebellum, okay? So the back part of the brain, cerebellum. Cerebellum deals with several important functions. First off will be motor coordination. So basically coordinating and spine tuning uh, muscle movements. Uh, one thing you can remember with this is that babies are very poorly developed in terms of the cerebellum. So when you see a baby walk or like move their arms, it's very spastic and out of control because their cerebellum isn't very uh, mature yet. As it gets mature, now they can smooth out those muscle movements, they can start crawling and walking. So that's one big thing with the cerebellum. The second thing will be balance. It has a lot of reflex centers to your inner ear to tell you basically where you are in space and keep you balanced so that if you're on like one leg, it'll tell all those muscles where to contract and where to relax so you can stay balanced, okay? And it also deals with something called muscle tone, muscle tone. This is kind of an automatic response of how uh, you contract muscles without thinking about it. Think about like uh, muscle memory, right? So when I'm standing up straight, I'm not thinking to contract my back muscles. I'm not thinking to contract my glute muscles. I'm just focusing on talking with you, writing on the board. Well, who takes over to tell these muscles to stay contracted or relaxed? 
the cerebellum. So I always remember that it is the cerebellum that keeps you balanced. Very cool, and well, as well as your uh, muscle tone. So that is everything you really need to know about the brain.